char is what the barrel uses to make the bourbon over the years as it sits in the barrel. And that char is numbered one through five. Most bourbon that most of us drink are three char, just like an FYI. I do a bourbon tour, and I've done a few of them over the years. Anybody here done bourbon tours besides me? Ron, have you done one? I figured you had. I know, Tom, you have. If you've done bourbon tours, again, everything they'll tell you is that the bourbon, and, and by the way, bourbon can have nothing else in it, no flavors, nothing. If it has apple in it, for example, you see apple, uh, I think Jim Bean has an apple bourbon. That's actually whiskey, but it's actually a liqueur. It's not considered bourbon if you add anything to it. So all the flavor comes from the barrel. That's why the barrel is so important. And there's only a few places in the country that even make barrels. And so, believe it or not, one of those places is Moni, Illinois. And uh, the fellow that uh, we're going to introduce here, my wife is on the call, so I got the dubious task of doing that. Lauren Bookmeyer started doing this a few years ago, and he'll tell you how he got into it. But when he got into it, um, he probably would be doing a whole lot more right now if he had one of the basic ingredients of a barrel, which is what, Lauren? I'm oh, sorry. I, I didn't hear you. What's the basic ingredients of a barrel? Where do you get it from? Uh, well, it's white oak, Quercus alba, although there are some uh, subspecies of Quercus alba. Um, her oak, her one. Okay. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to my wife, who will introduce Laura. <laughs> <laughs> um, welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming to the Heritage Center today. We have our phenomenal, very own Cooper, a master Cooper, who there aren't very many of you around in the world. I'll let Lauren tell you a bit more about that. But Lauren grew up in town. I remember Lauren when he was itsy bitsy. <laughs> and um, has been, he's an Afghan a veteran. Right. I'm sorry, that, right. one of those places that is not a good place to be right this minute. Well, that doesn't narrow it down very far, does it? No, um, no not that place. And, yeah, and um, a retired policeman from Berwyn, was it? And has decided this is a much, much healthier kind of a occupation to have. So he's been teaching himself and going to classes and learning cooperaging and is in the process of hopefully opening up a beer garden to bridge wonderful venue in Moni. So we're looking forward to that. And we asked uh, Lauren to come and just kind of show us what he's doing. And I think I miscommunicated that I was hoping that he would present and he will because I know once you start talking, it's all good. So. Yeah. <laughs> so please welcome Lauren Bubar and this is his son Holden. Holden and wife Elise. So thank you. Well, hello everybody. Um, I, I do apologize. I'm kind of winging it. Um, uh, we, we had stuff here we were going to be demonstrating. We we're actually going to be making uh, buckets today. And I figured we could just kind of talk about the principles as, as we went along. Um, but um, I guess I should start with kind of a brief history and overview of what a cooper is and, and what coopering um, is. So the first um, documentation of oak barrels uh, was uh, in 58 B.C. Uh, when Julius Caesar sent his legions into Gaul and then uh, what, what became Germany. And uh, the, the different various Celtic tribes uh, had been making barrels out of oak for whatever liquids they needed to, to store or uh, ferment. Um, one, one of the things that really impressed the Romans, who at the time were just using clay amphora, um, was their durability. Um, you know, you could drop one of those off a wagon, you can haul it in a wagon a thousand miles into battle and it'll be perfectly fine. Whereas clay amphora, they tend to, you know, lose a lot while traveling. But the other uh, unique uh, aspect about the oak is the flavor that it imparts to whatever's inside it. Um, it, it is used primarily because of a, a scientific principle known as tyloses. And uh, tyloses is um, a, 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 a property within the cell wall. Each, each cell wall um, in the xylem basically seals each cell, so water cannot permeate through it. Um, there's only a few types of wood that uh, possess the property of tyloses, white oak, of course, but then you have hickory, cherry, um, cherry um, a, a few other hardwoods. Yes, uh, chestnut. American chestnut was highly used in the cooperage industry 
up until about a hundred years ago when a blight came and, and decimated the entire species. Um, they don't exist anymore. Um, over uh, at my dad's place here, we do happen to be in possession of the only known quarter sawn American chestnut. So, kind of digressing here, but once we have our distillery established, we'll be making bourbon barrels and taking that chestnut after we do a lot of testing on it. I'm sure I'll have uh, help from some people here in the audience uh, <laughs> to help me do the testing. Um, but we're going to be toasting that chestnut and making rods and running it from head to head. Um, so we'll be creating a spirit that hasn't been tasted, or a nuance in a spirit that hasn't been tasted in over 100 years. Um, and we'll be the only Cooperage in the world. We're one of 26 Cooperages in the United States. Um, we're the only Cooperage in Illinois. Uh, but that, that tree will really be interesting to uh, experiment with and, and uh, be a real asset to our distillery. But getting back to the oak. So for millennia, um, white oak has been used um, for holding spirits or liquids, any kind of liquid. Um, and really it remained the mainstay until the advent of um, steel and plastics uh, in the 20th century, you know, post-World War II. During World War II, there were still uh, Navy Coopers. Um, so, so there were still men on ships who uh, had to be able to uh, repair barrels. Um, so it, it's really recent. In the last, uh, well, in the 1950s and 60s, Cooper really started to dwindle, and uh, most Cooperages across the country shut down. The only ones that did survive were the ones who were already well vested in the spirit industry, um, which is why we only have 26 Cooperages uh, in the United States today. I mean, at one point in town, in time, every town had a cooperage, um, or at least the cooper. Maybe it was the blacksmith slash cooper. Uh, maybe in a little town like Moni, uh, but um, you know, back then it was such a common thing. Um, this this is a, a hoop driver. It's a simple hammer, and it's a tool designed with this flat edge that, that you, you would use to pound those rings tight. When the oak sits around, it dries up and shrinks. So you, to swell it, you know, a lot of times you got to tighten up those hoops, but. I can guarantee almost every farmer had a hoop driver in their barn uh, because that was you know, necessary to uh, store whatever liquid they had. Um, so I got into coopering about seven years ago. Um, I hated my job. Uh, I did not like being a cop, but I didn't feel like I could really do as much as I wanted to help people. Um, and I didn't like a lot of things I saw in policing. Um, that combined with uh, PTSD I had from the Army, um, after 13 years I finally was able to resign and start doing this full time. So um, it was a long learning curve. Um, the only place I could find to learn anything about coopering uh, was Tillers International. They're a not-for-profit, actually 501c3 in um, Kalamazoo, Michigan. And they're basically Amish school. They teach everything there from blacksmithing to coopering uh, to timber framing. Um, and then they take the money from their classes and they go to Madagascar, um, Southeast Asia, and they help small villages uh, bootstrap an economy for themselves with whatever they have laying around. You know, if they have corrugated steel, they teach them to make some plows out of it and, and grow cotton for textiles. But um, they're a great organization. I highly recommend them if you're interested in taking any classes or learning any old world trades, uh, Tillers International. Um, so, uh, let's see, so, the way it works is we have to buy quarter sawn oak. Um, so, the way, the way the, the tree is set up with the uh, concentric rings, um, quarter sawn means exactly what it sounds like, you know, you're cutting the log into quarters, and then you're cutting boards out of each section. And it has to be quarter sawn because the grain pattern in the end of the oak has to be between 90 degrees and 45 degrees in order for it to retain water. Otherwise, that the, the principle of the tylosis and the xylem will not work, will be effective and it will leak. So you have to use quarter sawn or you know, some rift sawn is okay. Um, but that's uh, what we get when we start out. So when we get our oak uh, shipped to us. It is what they call five quarter in the industry. Um, so it's an inch and a quarter thick. And then one thing we do that few cooperages do, um, most cooperages get their oak kiln dry, um, which is bad because white oak is very high in tannin. 
Um, any wine drinkers out there have probably heard the term. Um, you know, it's the astringency and the mouthfeel that the, uh, the grapes create, and it really masks the palate, which is why if you're making a wine barrel, you have to air season the staves for a minimum of two years. Um, in, in France, they require four years of air seasoning, which means you're simply setting that oak out in the rain and the sun and the snow um, to basically break down those tannins and wash them out of the wood. So you no longer have that astringency in the mouthfeel and you can really enjoy the, the real palate that, that the oak can create. So once we've seasoned our wood, and you can see how it's all grayed and everything, and uh, that's, that's what happens with the seasoning, then we plane it down to one inch thick. Um, once it's planed down, we have to make that wood into a stave. Which, uh, you know what, Holden, you want to knock that 10-gallon barrel apart? Oh, so real quick, before Holden knocks this apart, just to show you, just to show you some size differences, um, we start out with 5-gallon Birkins. Uh, these are the smallest barrel we make. Uh, then we make 10-gallon barrels. We make 15, which I don't have here, but that's a 30-gallon barrel. And then these are 53-gallon barrel, which is your standard whiskey bourbon barrel. Uh, and over there is actually a hogshead. It's a 59-gallon wine barrel. We don't make 59-gallon uh, barrels. We only go up to 50. Uh, so, uh, Holden, if you want to knock this 10-gallon apart, then we can actually show them what a joint and stave it looks like. So, we take that rectangular piece of wood. So it comes like this. We plant it down. And then we have to put the joints. The stave has basically four joints to it. It's wide in the middle with the bilge, and it's the same dimension at the head, it's narrower. So uh, basically you're making a diamond shape out of the oak. So um, actually, uh, oh, you want to you wanna start, on on start working on this one? Uh, so basically, this is a shaving horse, and this is what the tool you would use um, to start shaping your stave. So, You'd start with a draw knife, and uh, actually I'll start doing this while Holden's getting ready to raise a barrel. So you, you take your uh, your piece of wood, pinch it down to the block, and basically you're going to start roughing out your joint um, in, into the shape that you're going to need. For a while, you know, you, you get pretty good at eyeballing your angle so that you're, you're getting it the angle, the taper right, your degree on the uh, on the joint itself. Um, and you have to calculate that by how many staves you're going to use. Um, you know, if, if you have a, a 20 stave barrel, well, that's two joints per stave, so uh, you would divide 360 by 40 by the amount of joints you have, and that gives you the degree of your angle. And over time, it's, you just get to the point where you just eyeball it and you pretty much know what that's going to look like. So, I started here, I've got one joint roughed, then I would uh, wind up doing uh, the other side, start working that down. Right? Yes. And you had to make the thing. Yeah, so yeah, we made all our own equipment, uh, shaving horse, and of course, this is not how we make our barrels, um, because uh, we would lose a lot of money, because it takes about a week to make one five-gallon barrel. Um, so we have implemented power tools into our process, uh, so we can make about a barrel a day, which doesn't leave uh, much room for profit, but um, we love doing it, and uh, you know, part of our, our uh, vertical integration with the distillery and all our plans, um, you know, we're, we're planning to make money on tourism uh, more so than the barrels, and just keep this as you know an artisanal craft that you know you can only go to 25 other places in the United States to see it happen. So once you get your stave roughed out, like all four joints on it, we have a jointer here, and so this is where you smooth out your joint. So you got to hold it on your angle, and you just run it across. And 
that's going to give you a nice smooth joint. And then of course you got to marry it up with the other side, meet it in the middle. So we've got the one side pretty much jointed, ready to go. So we wind up with a finished product that will look something like this. You have your angles here. And then once that's done, you have to hollow the stave out uh, to take away some of the, uh, the meat of the wood so it makes it easier to bend, more pliable. And then you round the back so that it uh, forms a nice uh, cylinder. So Holden's going to raise the barrel. Go ahead. Uh, you want to move the... Uh... Okay. process of setting it up before we start to close it. And this is uh, known in the industry as a mise en rose, um, M-I-S-E-E-N-R-O-S-E. -E -E. When I first started coopering and I heard the term mise en rose, I assumed that was some nice flowery French language <laughs> or something about a blooming rose. It literally means a raised barrel. Rose is raised, so <laughs> Mies is a barrel. So. Yeah. And while Holden's doing that, I can show you, well, uh, we have a couple of tools here. Uh, these are called uh, scorps or in shaves. Um, and these are what we would use to hollow out the uh, the stave once it was down start up pulling the wood out of the middle so uh, that's what these guys are for how did you find all your tools um eBay <laughs> <laughs> yeah here and there in an antique shop um, but uh, yeah they're, they're fairly common in, in on eBay uh, or at antique shops um, you know, fortunately, because barrels were so quintessential to life, just everyday life, um, you know, if you wanted to keep water or any sort of liquid, you had to have a barrel. So that means there is a plethora of 100-year-old tools available now and pretty cheap so, because there were so many. So uh, I guess one thing I could talk about, too, while Holden's was doing that, is the uh, antique gauges. Um, the first Cooperage I went to in Germany, um, uh, Herr Weissbrot, uh, he didn't speak any English. Um, I spoke a little German. <laughs> but luckily I had a friend there who could kind of translate. And this guy, um, there's a term uh, in German, unfreundlich, unfriendly. Um, German people are very standoffish, you know, unless they're drinking. They're drinking, you know, you see them at the fest, they want to get to know you, they're your buddy. But um, he was very kind of standoffish and wondered why I wanted to come and see his cooperage. And so he's kind of showing me around and everything. And then he went to his wall where he had all of his old gauges. And these are, these are what you would use uh, prior to machinery and everything else. So I pulled out my phone and I showed him my wall with all my gauges. And at that point, we were friends. He was like, oh, like I was, okay, you're a real cooper. Um, so when you're uh, making your, your rough stave, you have uh, different angles cut, you know, uh, 10 degree, 11 degree, 12 degree. So you have these different jigs. So when you're uh, jointing them, you can lay them over your joint, and it'll show you how close you are to your proper degree, uh, you know, depending on what degree you're going to need for uh, all your joints to raise your barrel. So let's see. Yeah, so that's, that's what you use all these rigs for to, uh, if you're going to do it the old way. Um, like I say, I use power tools now, so I have a tilted head shaper that I can just crank to the degree I need. And, you know, 
know, it does it, it does it for me. It does all the, the thinking for me. Um, well, don't so, cut yourself short. You got to do a little bit of math. Yeah. <laughs> so um, another tool: once you have your uh, your stave jointed, then then you want to hollow it out. Well, you use the end shape, like like I showed you here. But then to back it, to put the curved edge on the outside, you use a spoke shape. Um, so that simply, simply just you draw it along the wood and puts a nice, nice backed edge to it. Are all these tools completely specialized to barrel mounting? Or would they um, well, be on a farm for other yeah, things? Yes, Spokeshave, um, hence the name. Uh, the, it was probably originally designed to make spokes for wheels, um, but it comes in really handy to put your, your curve on the uh, outside of the staves. Um, but a lot of these, um, you know, obviously the, the gauges, that's all specific to coopering. One tool that is very specific to coopering is a crozing plane. So a crows which, uh, unfortunately, I didn't bring a barrel that has the parts cut into it. Oh. You can use some of those to show it off. Yeah. Draw it. Okay, well, quickly I can show you. When, when a barrel is, is, a stave is finished, you have to cut three parts into it. You have the chime, which is an angled piece, 45 degrees or so. Um, and that's not in there to protect the edge of the barrel. Because if you had a full, a full, uh, squared off stave, if something were to hit that, you could split that and tear that chunk out, causing the barrel to leak. So they, they started putting this bevel to cut called the chime on there to prevent barrels from being knocked around and you know all of a sudden your your bourbon that's been in there for two years is leaking out all over the floor because you knocked it into another barrel. Then you have the rounded part that's the howl and inside the howl is the crows, C-R-O-Z-E, which is where uh, we took our name from. Um, so you have various tools to accomplish that. Um, this is a crozing plane. So they have chiming planes that will cut that angle on the end. This cuts your howl, the rounded edge here, and then you flip it over to the other side. So you would take it into a barrel. Let's see, I'll put it up here so you can see. And you would just drop the uh, howl blade and just start working. Sometimes 
because if you can imagine, you know, the slightest movement on this is, is going to make a half inch difference. So, um, you know, it's you got to try it a few times for it. But once you have that, you basically have your uh, diameter. So if you had your head headboard, you would stick this in the middle, scribe it out, and that would give you your, your perfect uh, circumference for your head. So, yeah, then you just got to uh, work on the head to... to So your headpiece would have a profile where it ends up protruded that would fit directly into the gross. So uh, yeah, while I'm at it, uh, anybody know what uh, this hole is called in a barrel? Well, it's a bunghole. That's, that's where the term bunghole comes from. So if you watch Beavis and Butthead, uh, <laughs> that, that's where it originated. Um, Oh, so while we're on the topic of bungholes, this is a bunghole auger. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what you would do is uh, we'll use this for example. You can sit here. And I'm not going to go all the way on this one, but you have to push down on it and then just start to turn it. And it screws itself in. Starting is the hardest part once it gets started. But it screws itself in. There we go. Now it's going in. And you just keep turning it. And it's going to wind up uh, cutting out you know, this uh, inch wide hole. And then uh, this has a blade on the edge. So you just keep dig uh, cutting and cutting until you get to the, the uh, dimension you need for your bump. Okay. All right. So hold and uh, raise this barrel. So at this point, to get the barrel from looking like this to looking like this, uh, there's two methods to close the barrel. There's steam and then there is fire bending. Uh, we use fire bending um, just because fire is more fun. Um, so what you have to do is you create a fire inside of a crescent though and keep it controlled because the last thing you want is for your barrel to actually catch on fire while you're trying to you know, make a functional barrel. So, you would have to have a crescent. Uh, here's an example of one. Now, this one is sized for a five gallon barrel. So, we would basically light our fire in here with our oak. Um, most modern cooperages use propane uh, because it's faster. Um, and they do what they call an eight minute speed toast. And in eight minutes, they're able to bring the boiling po or bring the moisture content in these staves, which naturally sit at barometric pressure between 12% and 14% moisture. And that's what it has to be. If it's any drier, you'll crack a bunch of staves. Uh, if it's too wet, you'll crack a bunch of staves. Um, so we use the fire method, and it takes on an average about 25 minutes. Um, now, if you're not mining your fire and it starts to die down, then you're in trouble because you got to try to get that heat built up again. But at that point, you might go too long. You have about a three-minute window. Um, I found that 25 minutes, if you keep your fire maintained, is is the the golden spot. Um, if you pull it off a couple minutes too soon, the the moisture in the wood is not quite boiling yet, so it won't be pliable. You'll crack staves. If you leave it on too long, it'll dry out and you'll crack staves. Um, I never had a, a laser measurement tool. I just learned by simply touching the outside of the staves with the backs of my fingers, and I, I, I can I know exactly when it's right and you know like clockwork. I, I just know when it's hot enough. So once it's hot enough, you pull it off the fire, then you put it in a windlass, which I didn't bring because it's rather huge. But a windlass is a device. Um, originally, they were made with rope, and they would have a big. Uh, uh, wheel that you'd have to turn to crank it. So you double loop the rope, put it around the barrel, and it would be tied to one end, and then you spin the windlass, now that the wood is pliable, and it would squeeze it and pull those staves in together until they were closed on the other end. Um, we use um, an electric winch because that's way easier than using a windlass. Um, but once it's closed, then we give it its true toast. I wish we would have brought the toast levels. Um, so, uh, most cooperages, again, they do an eight minute propane toast and then they char the barrel. Um, we do a proper um, 
European standard toast before we char the barrel. Whiskey barrels, most distillers don't know much about barrels. Um, and they want to char three barrel for whiskey, but they don't know anything about the toast levels. So what toasting does, the heat draws the sugars from the summer growth rings towards the fire. So if you see all these little light colored bands here, that's your summer growth rings, that's where all the sugar's at. So when it's sitting there with the fire inside, slowly drawing those sugars in, they're becoming caramelized in the wood, and that's how you uh, uh, create your complexity in your palate, whether it's for wine or, or whiskey. Um, unfortunately, a lot of distillers don't apply this to whiskey, which they should. Um, so after that, once you give it its toast, whether it's a light toast, medium, medium long, medium plus, heavy, uh, they, they all accomplish different flavor profiles. Um, so from there you give it a char, and char is predominantly, uh, it has a few purposes. One is to create color and aroma, and the other major factor that the char does is it, uh, it breaks down the congeners that can uh, exist in the spirit and kind of create a foul or off taste. Um, but the other thing it does do is it converts some of those caramel, caramelized sugars into phenols. Um, those phenols oxidize just like caramelized sugars do. Um, but the phenols are what really give it the vanilla, the, the distinct vanilla taste that oak is known for. Um, but it's, it's those caramelized sugars behind that that are going to sit in there and really change the, uh, the complexity of the whiskey. So, um, once it's charred, that's when we would go then and cut the chime, howl, crows, make our heads. Um, and then we'd swell it and uh, ship it. Um, oh, you want to show them how the fro works? Uh, so we, uh, we make, make a few different types of products. One is, is uh, buckets. Uh, we use cedar for that. Um, but the way that would start is you, you'd have your block, your course on block. There you go. So, uh, start with that. And uh, you take a fro and start uh, shaving them off into smaller pieces that then you'd split again for your bucket staves. Sometimes, on a rare occasion, you'll have a barrel that, that may be leaked. And uh, that's why we swell them all and test them to make sure that they're not leaking by the time they go to a distiller. Um, and usually within a few minutes, you know, okay, the barrel's good. But once in a while, you'll have a damp spot that just persists. And a couple days later, you still got that damp spot. So at that point, one of the fixes we do is we'll take the head back out and we take cattail reed. And we flag the crows with pieces of this cattail reed. We just split it and we fill it into the, the little gaps. Or if you have a, a stave, if it's leaking somewhere between a stave, you know, you take the rings off to separate it and you just slip some of this down in there. And this compresses and blocks the liquid. Um, so this is an ancient way. Um, Cattails is common in North America, but there's also European cat. Uh, I can't remember if it's called European or it's German. Uh, but anyway, there's a European cattail that now pretty much has taken over in the U.S. Most cattail you see here is actually European cattail, but it's still at least cousins with its you know original North American cattail. The problem we have now is Phragmites. Phragmites are an invasive grass that people planted over the last. 50 years is a decorative grass, and anywhere you look like the protected wetland that's in Moni, full of Phragmites, and, and they are so invasive, they, they burrow down, their root system is impossible. Once they're in, you can't get rid of them. I know for a fact that the village has gone in a couple times and dragged it and tried to pull them out, but those root systems go so deep. Once they're in, there's little to nothing you can actually do about it, and, and it's unfortunate, but uh, never plant foreign species as, as 
for decorating. I mean, we've got plenty of beautiful uh, natural uh, flora within the state of Illinois, or at least North America, that, you know, that never plant foreign plants because they kill everything else. Um, so, another problem is the, uh, the leaves that come off of the Phragmites, we can't use them. So, we've got a little patch of um, cattails left. Once we build our place, we're going to have a, uh, a bioretention cell uh, with a pond and everything, but we'll be cultivating our own um, cattail root. But then the other, the other thing we use, the other cheat we use, is beeswax. Um, beeswax, you know, in its solid form. Um, it, it, it's impermeable to water, so if you were to, if your head was a little bit too small, you could uh, heat up the beeswax, spin your head through it, put a, a little layer of beeswax on it, put the head in, and it'll seal right up, and you know, be good forever. So these are the two natural ways that have been used for thousands of years to fix leaks. All right, so um, yeah. The next step after splitting the log is splitting the split pieces into stave size. So, usually we just split them in half, like that. And then at that point, you sit on the shaving horse and whittle it down into a bucket stick. So, we'll um, start in a minute if you want to. So at this point, I, I think we've kind of covered all the basics of barrels. Um, questions? Yes. When you were heating the barrel and you pulled out the I assume you have different cages for different size barrels. Is it a pretty much consistent as far as time wise? Yes. Um, you know, so a yeah, and, and, and it is a five gallon barrel, basically twenty minutes to twenty five minutes. Yes, because uh, our, our sizes of presses get exponentially bigger in relation to the size of the barrel. So yeah, good question. Um, and again, it's subject to human error. You know, if, if you're, you're doing something else, you know. Multitasking, you know, sometimes I'm not that great at it. Mm -hmm. And I'll have a, a barrel toasting, I'll go off and do something else, and then I'll totally forget my fire's down to nothing, and i got to kind of stoke it back up. So, you know, but, uh, yeah, that's, that's it. <laughs> One state has a knot in it. Would you use that and have a little gap in it? No, we wouldn't. Good question. Yes. So, knots leak. Um, one of the tedious parts of coopering is sorting through the wood. Um, we had oak that we had purchased to make barrels out of, and it, it was terrible. It was so full of sapwood and nuts. Right yeah, and um, now with the, the concentric rings on the tree, the wood toward the outside is known as sapwood, and it's the softer wood, um, and, and water spirit would permeate right through it. Um, so you can't use the outer portions, and um, yeah, I had a bad batch where we see all the flaws until we planed it down. We spent so much time going through it and wanted to only use about 3%. Um, we try to utilize every inch of wood we can. Um, there are uh, a couple of issues. One is an oak blight um, that is destroying the eastern white oak, which is the, the species that's used for barrels. Um, University of Kentucky is kind of ahead of it, and, and they're you know doing a lot of research and development and, and trying to... Um, you know, create blight resistant oak. Um, but then there's a second blight west of the Rockies. Uh, if it does cross over, we won't have oak. Um, it just won't exist. So we try to utilize every bit we can. And, and like when we're cutting our staves, like any chunks that come off, we use in our crescents to toast our barrels. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it, it all gets used. And like even in that bad batch, we were able to, uh, you know, make decorative stuff out of it or. Uh, use it for toasting. Uh, it seems like you never have enough wood to toast. Uh, any other questions? So would you char the inside of a pickle barrel? Good question. I think the deli owner would be the guy to ask. <laughs> 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 I, I don't know. Um, somebody did just recently reach out to me and ask me for a pickle barrel. Sauerkraut, wasn't it? Oh, sauerkraut, that's right. But um, I believe they would just toast it. Uh, because uh, if, if you were to char it, all that charcoal, um, I assume, would, would kind of just, I don't know, uh, affect the way the pickles looked at the end of the day. Um, I, I assume it's just toasted. Well, you don't typically char wine barrels. Right, right. They're always toasted. They're toasted but not charred. Right. And you see now there's a lot of wine companies that are experimenting and they'll finish their wine in a used bourbon barrel 
uh, for a couple of months. Um, for furnish their bourbon in a wine barrel. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Or, you know, the scotch and the sherry and the port barrels. Yeah. yeah. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, trading barrels going on these days. <clears throat> All right. Well, um, if, if anybody has any questions or wants to stick around, uh, check we everything out. The you're, you're more than welcome to come and, and take a look and check out the tools. Well, we yes, still uh, need to try the barrel. When do you expect to have your facility open? Well, I'm hoping that uh, by September we can have a beer garden, a 750 square, square foot beer garden set up. Um, I'm hoping, uh, if, if all goes well, um, I'm hoping that by the third weekend in September we can host our inaugural Oktoberfest, nice. um, the weekend after Fall Fair. Um, so we're, 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 uh, we're hoping and, and we're really working hard to uh, get it all done by then. And where are you located? We are on Egyptian Trail, right where um, Governor's Highway and Egyptian Trail intersect, but it's a half mile long gravel driveway. And, and the property sits behind the woods. So if it's your first time out there, uh, yeah, you'll, you'll need to really uh, call ahead. Um, so we can find it. Well, we'll have signage then. So make it easy. I hope you get signed. Yes. Sounds interesting. Yeah, it'll, it'll be a lot of fun. I think it'll be a unique place. Um, really the only place in the world where you can see the entire process of how your favorite spirit's made from the tree to the glass. There's nowhere else in America or the world where, where you can see it all in one spot. So, yeah, it's, it'll, be, it'll be unique. It'll be, I'll be Moni. <laughs> when are you going to start your distillery? Where you to make it? So we have it, our, our plan is set in phases, um, and the distillery is the final phase, um, which hopefully will be started by, I believe, August of next year and completed uh, before uh, 2024. So if there's no more oak, you mean of any kind? Well, there there's lots of oaks, but red oak um, and, and the red oak family does not have the property of tylosis. So, so you can quarter use... saw red oak and make barrels out of it and it'll just be like a colander, like the water will just be gushing out of it. Be, you know, good so for watering your plants. red oak and oak, those don't work. But there are three other types, well, there are two other types of wood in the white oak family. There's swamp oak and fir oak, which have the exact same properties as white oak. Yeah, so, so they're, they're um, a subspecies of Quercus alba, but Quercus alba is what the industry prefers. Um, you know, they, they make plenty of whiskey barrels out of bur oak and um, swamp oak, but, um, you know, they like to it's say that it's, it's the real white oak. Yeah. And, Swamp doesn't sound as appealing. <laughs> and, 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 yeah. And I think what's what's more more important than the actual um, than the actual um, species is where it grows. Um, most of the whiskey barrels are um, are hewn from uh, trees from the Ozarks. You know where you have a hot climate, mild winters. So you you don't have a lot of growth rings in every inch because you know the, the summers are long and. Um, when you go further north, you have a lot more uh, um, growth rings per inch, so that's more sugars, uh, more potential manipulation for you know a great palate. So, yeah, I, I think northern oak is better than southern white oak. So I think it's more critical than anything. So in the meantime, are you making um, extra items out of your white oak and things that are bear related? We were just down in Kentucky, and they were selling all kinds of cool stuff that were because bourbon tasting and whatnot is such a big industry right now. Yeah, we have a, a litany of, of side products from, you know, charcuterie boards to um, Did you bring some of those flights. to show us? Yes. Yeah, mm. Sell us? Stuff there. Sure, absolutely. <laughs> uh, um, coat racks. Um, uh, buckets. Buckets. Um, yeah, there, there's a lot of different things we're able to make with it. Um, so yes. Like I'd tell my brother if he had the right price. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, feel free to, to come on up and, and take a look at uh, any of this. And if you, if you want to try your hand here at the <laughs> shaving horse, you're more than welcome. We've got plenty of wood for you to chew through. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Well, thank you all.
So I want to thank um, Lauren and Holden and Elise and the Emmett somewhere. Emmett's over here. <laughs> Emmett. And um, we'll hopefully have Lauren back next year and be able to talk about all those things. But please take a look at what he's got up here because this is a shoestring operation as well. So it is. We'll support our local vendors. Thank you. Thank you very much. Everybody. What? Oh, okay. He walked. He got lost, but he found Brian. Yeah. Right there. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.